Okay, so now we're going to quickly go over respiratory acidosis and some important points regarding that and some things you're probably going to expect to see on any of the standardized tests. All right, so on the low end of the spectrum, we have pH to 7.35 to 7.45 is the higher end of the spectrum for the pH levels. Uh, carbon dioxide is going to be anywhere from 35 to 45, which is easy because it's the same as the back end of your pH numbers. Your bicarbonate, I always remember, is 22 to 26 because those are the only even numbers and all of these numbers together. So I always remembered uh, 22, 26. So... 2 plus 2 plus 2 is 6, 22, 26. There you go. So the only even numbers are the bicarbonate. So that's, I don't know if that'll help you, but there it is. All right, next slide. Okay, regarding the pH, so your pH is going to be below 7.35. Your PaCO2 or your you know CO2 carbon dioxide is above 45 when you have a, a patient with respiratory acidosis. Now, let's talk about compensation. This always has to do with your bicarb or your HCO3. So your HCO3 normal range is 22 to 26. So if your HCO3 is between 22 and 26 and you have this patient, right, who has the pH below 7.35 and who has the CO2 above 45, all right, if that's, if that CO2 is normal, or sorry, if that HCO3 is normal, if that bicarb is normal, you haven't done anything, so you're uncompensated. See, what happens is, is there's a balance. I always talk to you about energy, frequency, vibration, and balance, so here's the balance game. If my balance is tipped to the left, a.k.a. my CO2 is way higher than it needs to be and my pH is below 7.35, I'm past the threshold of balance on the left side, right? Because low is on the left, high is on the right, right? So scale is tipped all the way down. So what I have to do to compensate that is I have to change this guy over here on the right, and that would be... HCO3 or the state of alkalosis, right? Because we have all of this bicarb over here. So what's going to happen is, is if everything on my bicarb side is normal, I've done nothing. My scales are tipped to the left, period, uncompensated. If the HCO3, the right side of the scales, if it is higher, then we are partially compensated because look, this pH is still below 7.35. This 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 carbon dioxide CO2 is still above 45. So those numbers are wackadoo. But our HCO3 is moving just a little bit, so we're partially compensated. Now, if the pH is finally normalized, which means we're 7.35, 7.36, things of that nature, we're in the lower end of the range, 7.38, right? And then the carbon dioxide is still above 45, and then the HCO3 is sky high as well. We're fully compensated because our pH is level. It's normal. So we are fully compensated. So how can we get this problem of respiratory acidosis? Well, it's a matter of hypo, hypoventilation, as in we are not getting enough ventilatory effort to kick off or push out that carbon dioxide. So acute respiratory distress syndrome, asthma, pneumonia, COPD, also don't ever count out respiratory depression due to opioids, due to benzodiazepines, due to PCA pumps. You will always get a question about a PCA pump patient and knowing that their problem is respiratory acidosis and you need to stop that PCA pump or stop that medication. Don't be a dummy, right? Being smart is yummy. So get it out of their veins as fast as you can. Stop the pump, things of that nature. This is a matter again of inadequate chest expansion. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so when we think of someone with respiratory acidosis, I always think of classic COPD patient. What are they? They're short of breath, right? They're in the tripod position. They got a barrel chest. They are lethargic because they can't, they're on the low of the low spectrum, right? So they, they don't have enough energy. The energy is so ridiculously low that walking from A to B, just even a couple of feet, is a physical chore. Eating is a physical chore. So I need for you to think about how hard it is to be able to speak uh, as fast as I speak and as quickly as I speak. You can't. It usually is after about six to nine words, you're panting like a dog who hasn't had water in days. Um, you're confused, duh, because of all of that. All of the above, right? Pale, cyanotic, 
you're you're blue you're white why because you're not getting enough oxygen your tissues are going just feed the brain i don't even care i don't even care just make me cold and green it's fine right things of that nature polycythemia you have too many red blood cells because your body's like calling all cars we don't have any oxygen calling all cars just make a bunch of babies yep that's it make a bunch of red blood cells <sighs> over over I mean, that's what they do. They say, just make as many as you can. And they come flooding down the gates, but they only have a little bit of oxygen binding capacity. So you have these types of issues that can make you very, 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 very ill. So remember, if this is a sympathetic or a parasympathetic process, right, this change, is that is it the hyperparasympathetic end of the spe spectrum or is it the hyperparasympathetic end of the spectrum, a.k.a. am I... Am I freaking out, mistrusting and combusting, aka hyperventilating, or um, am, am I unable to move and, and things won't operate because I just have a lack of, well, energy source in general, all right? So that would be the hypo side of things. And again, this is a hypoventilatory issue, so there you go. So much like anything else, we're going to treat the case in the situation. We have to focus on the cause, right? Um, so again, pain meds. If I have a PCA pump and this patient has a respiratory rate of, I don't know, eight, that's a classic symptom and a classic, you know, question or scenario that pops up often. Uh, this person is respiratory depressed, depressed because they don't have enough ventilatory effort to kick off the CO2. So we would simply shut off the pump. Uh, if this is an opioid issue, then a naloxone is going to be our jam um, because that is for opioids. If we have benzos, then fluminazil is our jam for that, right? Also bronchodilators, uh, that's going to be important because we want to get the best breath that we can with what we have with those alveoli. So we want to give it a uh, kind of a bump up. So we will do bronchodilators and things of that nature to open up uh, that, that bronchial tree, to open up that airway, to open up um, and do things to expand those alveoli. Uh, we will we will eventually put you on an incentive spirometer, right? Because that's going to also tucker you out a lot. So we have to be careful about that, especially if they're exacerbated. But once we get them level, that would be something we would do again to get a really nice breath and try to stretch those alveoli as much as we can. All right, that's it. That's all we got. I hope it helped and I hope you enjoy this. So I will continue to do little shorts. Thanks.